in long-term capital management, a Greenwich, uh, Connecticut hedge fund that basically collapsed. The Federal Reserve Bank had to come in to prop them up. Our own stock market, uh, in response, fell 20 percent, and we were worried that we would go through a similar uh, meltdown. So this is what was they were facing. Now, what is significant here is that in 1999, you see that the GDP begins to go up, and it continues to go up. It's gone up every year since then. In August 1999, uh, Yeltsin, who was the president then, presiding over this collapse, appoints Vladimir Putin as the prime minister. He becomes prime minister in August 1999. December 31st, he becomes the acting uh, president, because Putin annou uh, Yeltsin announces his premature resignation, and in March, he's elected. Now, look, so from 1999 on now, the GDP begins to go up with, with just consistently. And so for the Russians, it's easy to understand. They associate Putin with nothing else. He comes into office, and the economy begins to respond, and Russia comes back, and uh, tr the Treasury is filled now. Russia has uh, savings of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sovereign fund of approximately $500 billion worth of gold, rubles, uh, gold, not rubles, but gold and dollars and, and euros. The ruble has gained 20 percent value relative to the dollar. So they are, are floating, and if, so it's easy to understand why the Russian people say it's Putin who did it, and that uh, the, if you take a public opinion poll, 80 percent of the Russian people say Putin is the one we support and, and we want to sustain. So the question is, to what extent, and this is what the book looks at, to what extent is this all due to Putin, and to what extent is it uh, independent? And, and I'm old enough to know now that when I give lectures, people are awake the first 10 minutes. Uh, after a while, by the middle of the lecture, they're thinking, when's he going to end? Uh, and so they're not paying attention. By the end of the lecture, they're all, everybody races for the door. So I'll tell you the answer now. Uh, so people said, what does he say? Uh, you, you know what the answer is. And the answer is, Putin did make a difference, but not because he didn't create this. What, what is created, and again, to give you that answer so you can think about other things, is you see the, the line adjacent to that dark line, and that shows the change in oil production. And <clears throat> this is most unusual in social science. Whenever oil production drops, GDP drops. And even in 1997, when it goes up a touch, GDP goes up. And thereafter, without fail, it's a perfect correlation. So that <clears throat> it's clear that oil production drives this. And so I tell my wife that, look, if I had been uh, appointed uh, prime minister of Russia in August 1999, and oil prices begin to go up, as they do, and oil production begins to go up, even I would look like a genius. So it's not, unless you can tell me that Putin is the reason oil production drops, and that oil prices drop, and then oil prices go up again, you can't really say that uh, it's Putin's doing. It's really a case of oil, and that's why I call the book Petrostate. Uh, it's not Saudi Arabia. In fact, Russia is producing, has been producing more petroleum than Saudi Arabia. It's the largest producer of petroleum in the world. It's not the largest exporter. Saudi Arabia is, and Saudi Arabia is now again increasing production, but that, that is the explanation. So you can go home now, uh, but, and you won't, but you won't hear what Putin did. So let me now say, what difference did Putin make? Well, <clears throat> that goes to the next table. If you look at it, uh, and, and Putin did make a difference. He didn't affect oil price changes. That, of course, is the market, and oil prices go from $10 a barrel to today, uh, what is $140 a barrel? So you can, and it's that change in oil price which has led uh, oil companies in Russia to go out into the extreme conditions, particularly in the Arctic, and begin to invest. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. It's the conditions are too extreme. So what did Putin do? Well, you know, Putin was trained as a lawyer, and then he joined the KGB, and then he went to East Germany, where he served as a KGB agent. But the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, and there was no, he, had, he was unemployed. So he went back to Leningrad, as it was then called, and he got a job with his former, one of his former law professors, a man by the name of Subchak, who became the governor of St. Petersburg. And uh, he put uh, Putin in charge of foreign economic relations. That's what KG Wayne knows. This is what 
the KGB agent is, is always, you're dealing with is always a KGB agent. But then Subchak lost the election. And what to do? Uh, again, Putin was unemployed. So what happened is, while he was in this kind of limbo in 1997, he decided to write a short dissertation. We, we have it. Uh, and what he, what he does is he examines the question, what should Russia be doing to bring back its superpower status? What can we do? What do we have? We don't have manufacturing. Our military is discredited. It's bogged down in Chechnya. Uh, we don't have anything. The only thing we have going for us are our raw materials. And so he says, we've got to take those raw materials, many of which had been turned over to private companies, take them back, put them in control, and use them to promote Russia's interests. And so he adopts this notion of what he calls national champions. And the, the thesis has been available, it's been translated, uh, and he calls for the creation of national champions. What we should do is go back and take over that gas, take over that oil, the, the ferrous metals, the non-ferrous metals, put them in entities which are controlled by the state, and use them to advance Russia's interests, just like ExxonMobil advances the United States' interests. Now, there's a sidelight here. If this were fiction, you'd say, it, no, it couldn't be real, but, but it, this is real. It turns out that we know that Putin plagiarized uh, that, that idea uh, from two professors from Pittsburgh University. He took, as a whole, uh, uh, 10 to 15 pages, word for word, in Russian, of course, but that book, their book had been translated into Russian. Uh, the next time you see Putin, you can ask him where did it, did it come, f come from. But it's, you know, it's, we, we, we well, can see, see him. I'm going to see him. Uh, I, we saw him in somebody, the guy, actually the guy who discovered this was a man by the name of Clifford Gotti. Even he didn't ask Putin uh, this kind of thing. But, it, but it's there. And look at this table and see what happens. When he wrote this, it was just what you would write off as an ex academic exercise, which means you know, it'll never come to fruition. Because this is 1997. Putin is now, you know, in St. Petersburg, now just a, a, an ordinary administrator. There's no chance he's going to go to Moscow. If he does go to Moscow, how in the world is he going to be prime minister, much less the president? But he does. He gets there, and look what happens. He's elected uh, president on his own in March 2000. Immediately, he begins to implement this notion. And what has been happening is he is concerned by the fact that the people who had privatized these companies, including Gazprom, have been stripping assets, taking the assets off from what were these companies not wholly owned by them and transferring them to other companies that they controlled. Now, Chernomirdin, who's first on this list, actually had been the minister of the gas industry in the Soviet era. He then becomes uh, prime minister, and he leaves, and his, his deputy, if you go down fourth on the list, a man by the name of Yakarov, takes over and they become, he becomes the uh, head of the, the CEO of Gazprom. They privatize the gas ministry, as I mentioned in the beginning, and they take over and they begin to strip off assets. One of the companies they strip off assets to is a company called Itura. Now the strangest thing is that Itura is located, you'd never guess, uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. Why in Jacksonville, Florida? Why not? It's warmer. Uh, it's nicer. Wonderful beach home. <laughs> and so Yitra becomes the second largest producer of natural gas in Russia. And if you're a natural, uh, uh, if you're an if you're energy company in the United States, what's the first thing you do? You get a lobbyist. So, uh, you know, like any red-blooded uh, energy company, you've got to have a lobbyist in Washington. So they find a young woman, they pay her a half million dollars, and only by coincidence does it turn out that her father is a congressman. Not from Jacksonville, Florida, from Philadelphia. It's not too close, but you take them where you can get them. Uh, his name is Kurt Weldon. And Kurt Weldon becomes, in effect, the man from Itura related to Gazprom. And as far as we can tell, the, the ownership of Itura is, is very opaque. But it consists of the, the children of Chernomirin and Vyakarev, their wives, and as well as other senior executives, and their mistresses. They're all there together. It's a nice... It's a nice happy family. And Itra then now is here, and what do they do? Weldon is the man from Itra. He hosts them, and he has a reception for the executives from Itra at the Library of Congress. He goes to Jacksonville to uh, help them dedicate their new offices. He arranges for an $800,000 grant from the uh, Development Office, the U.S. Trade and Development Office, to help Itra develop natural gas 
deposits in Russia, which is not normally what U.S. organizations uh, funded by the government are, are supposed to do. Then, you know, as a subplot on a subplot, how do we know all this? Well, you may remember the Department of Justice, our U.S. Department of Justice, was accused of digging into dirt on various congressmen in order to increase the number of Republicans to defeat the Democrats. And indeed, Weldon loses the election in 2006 after the Department of Justice reveals all this information. The only trouble is Weldon is a Republican. Somebody got their signals mixed. They were supposed to go out after Democrats. You know, so you can see why this is also fascinating. And so now he's out, and indeed, uh, ITRA no longer has its, its, its congressman. But what, what Putin is doing now is getting rid of these people because they've stolen assets from Russia. So he gets rid of Chernomyrdin. He gets rid of Yakarev.